Thank you so much, everyone, for being here and for inviting me to speak. I'm really honored to get to speak with such great other scientists as well. Um, and today I'm going to be telling you about some work I've done in my postdoc, thinking about how we can detect adaptation in maize. Um, so as evolutionary biologists, we're generally really interested in understanding how organisms adapt to their, lo to new and lo to their local environments, especially to new and different environments. And so one way of answering this question is looking at the natural variation that we see present within species and trying to understand what the selective forces are that shape this variation. So if we see differences in traits like uh, life history or color or other whole, whole organism traits or things like molecular traits like gene expression, um, can we explain the variation we see in these traits due with neutral processes alone or can we infer that selection has contributed to the divergence that we see? And so because there's been a long history of asking these kinds of questions, we have a lot of methods to de develop for trying to understand whether the variation we see in natural populations is consistent with drift or with selection. And so in general, these methods require two pieces of information. First, we have to know whether the variation we see is genetic. And so traditionally, scientists will grow or rear individuals from different populations in a common garden and try to understand, you know, are the differences that we saw, for example, in plant size, due to genetic changes. In addition, it's important to not only know whether there is genetic variation, but to actually be able to quantify it. And this is often done using VA or additive genetic variation, and traditionally done using crosses to get individuals of known relatedness and use that to understand the quantitative amount of variation present within the population. Next, we also need information about relatedness to try to understand if what we see is consistent with drift or selection. And that's because relatedness between populations really shapes um, what our expectations are for how similar traits in different populations should look to each other. So if we see two populations that are quite different from each other, phenotypically, um, and we know that there's been a lot of time since their most recent ancestor, so a lot of time for these populations to drift, we might not be that surprised to see trait differences. However, if our two populations are very closely related to each other, we're now more surprised to see trait differences due to drift, and this might be more consistent with selection increasing trait divergence. And so one way that all of this information has been combined is in QST-FST approaches. And so QST is essentially a measure of how much of the genetic variation for a trait within a species is partitioned between different populations. And FST is an analogous measure for neutral, um, based on neutral genetic divergence. And so the idea behind a QST-FST test is you're testing for more divergence between populations than you expect based on neutral genetic variation. And so today what I'm going to tell you about is a bit about how I've been using, or how we've been using this um, logic to try to understand uh, what forces shape genetic variation within populations in systematic ways. You know, as a field, we're starting to develop these large genomic data sets where we have information from lots and lots of individuals, sometimes instead of in distinct subpopulations across a continuous range of relatedness. We might have lots of phenotypes, in particular molecular phenotypes like transcriptomes. And so there's a real opportunity here to try to understand how the force, how, um, how drift and uh, selection together shape genetic vari or shape the phenotypic variation that we see in nature. And so the methods I'm going to be talking today often rely on a kinship matrix. So I'm just going to walk you through briefly how this works. Um, and so in this cartoon, this kinship matrix shows us how related individuals are to each other. So lighter colors mean that individuals are more related to each other. And we can see that within our cartoon subpopulations, individuals are more closely related to each other. But we can also describe more complicated relatedness patterns, like the individual B1 here shares relatedness with individuals in population A. And so we can summarize this relatedness matrix using eigenvectors. Uh, and this is essentially getting the principal components of relatedness for these populations. And so the key point here is that individuals, um, individuals that are more closely related to each other will fall more closely together on these principal components. Now that we have these patterns of relatedness, we can now compare these to the genetic variation that we see in traits. And so what I've been doing is plotting the principal components of a given, a certain principal component of the relatedness matrix against a trait to try to understand how these two factors are related to each other. And so 
we can might expect that even if there's no selection, we could see some relationship between principal components and our traits, because individuals that are more closely related to each other would be more phenotypically similar to each other. However, the direction of this correlation could go either way, because individuals in a specific population are equally likely to drift up or drift down. And so we can use this logic or this intuition to understand um, or develop, try to develop a sense of what kinds of correlations we expect to see just due to drift. And I'll walk you through the model for how we do this. Essentially, and this is based on a multivariate normal model of drift, where we're assuming that our traits are made up of um, additive combinations of many alleles. And so under this model, the slope of our trait against the principal component under neutrality, we expect to be normally distributed around a mean of zero with a variance that's based on the amount of relatedness that's explained by our principal component and the amount of VA that's present within our populations. And because our principal components are orthogonal to each other, we can estimate VA using a subset of principal components and then use that to make inferences about selection acting on additional principal components. Now, selection has acted to increase trait divergence by increasing potentially size in one of our populations. We expect this to increase the slope of the correlation between principal component one and size. And this is the signature that we can use to detect selection acting across this axis of relatedness. And so we can rearrange the equation I showed you before to construct a test where we're looking, we're, we're looking for excess, an excess slope um, beyond what we expect based on the amount of VA and um, the amount of relatedness explained by our principal component. And this is the test that we've developed for, um, for understanding uh, how we can detect local adaptation in these kinds of populations. So now that I've explained the test, I'll tell you a bit about how we've been applying it to MAZE. And MAZE is a really cool system for trying to think about local adaptation because it was domesticated in Mexico and has since spread all over the world um, across North America Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so as maize has spread, it's had to adapt to a lot of new environments, um, and or we assume it's adapted to a lot of new environments. I guess I'll tell you at some point soon. Um, and so uh, I'm first gonna tell you about an application of our test to 240 domesticated inbred maize lines. And these all come from individuals uh, that are present in the public breeding panel, or public breeding uh, programs. And we have whole genome sequence data for these individuals and 22 traits that were measured in a common garden. And so this is just the kinship matrix of our maize populations. And so you can see it's quite complex and there's not clear subpopulations, um, but we can still divide things into sort of larger groups. Um, these are the first two principal components of relatedness within our population. As we can see that PC1 is separating out, for example, tropical maize lines from sweet corn lines. But there's still quite a lot of variation within our populations. And so now I'm just gonna show you for on the x-axis is our principal component, and the y-axis is a trait kernel number. And these blue dotted lines tell us what our expectations are under neutrality. And now I'm going to show you what the real data looks like for the trait kernel number. And so we see all these dots as a different maze line within our populations, and the purple line is, the solid purple line is showing us the observed correlation. And what we see is while there's some relationship, it's not beyond what we expect to see due to drift. And so we can explain the variation we see in kernel number with drift. However, we can look at a different trait like flowering time. And again, I'm showing you the same information on this plot. Um, but we can see now that when I plot the real data out that we see divergence in flowering time along principal component one. And this is far more than we would expect to see due to drift. And so really what this is telling us is that while we may have known before that tropical lines flower later than um, our other lines, now we can say that this flowering time difference is more extreme than we can explain due to drift, and so it's consistent with local adaptation. And we can do this for additional principal components. So for example, this is principal component six, and it's spreading out the individuals within our tropical population. And so we can see that there's some evidence for local adaptation occurring within our subpopulations as well, not just across these larger axes of variation. We've also been looking at testing for selection on gene expression. We have gene expression data from 208 of our 240 maize lines across seven tissues that include tissues like um, seedling, leaf, and different time periods, and kernel. And this is work that's being done by an undergrad I'm mentoring, Jennifer Blanc, uh, 
And so she's gone through and applied the same sort of test I just told you about to gene expression levels across all of these about 10,000 different genes. And so we can pull out signatures of what looks like selection on gene expression level. However, what we're really excited about doing with this is now, we can, since we can do this for 10,000 genes, not only doing the test to see in general how many genes and that are how many gene expression levels and kernels show evidence of selection, but whether our estimates of how many genes show evidence of selection differ across tissues, and if we can pull out whether specific tissues show stronger evidence of adapt adaptation for gene expression. Um, we've also been applying this method to try to detect adaptation in genotypes that haven't been phenotyped. Um, and so this is getting increasingly important because phenotyping is extensively is quite expensive, especially compared to genotyping. And so it would be useful to have methods that let us detect selection um, in individuals where we have genomes for them, but not phenotypes. And so I'm going to tell, telling you about how we've applied this to European maize land races. And I think this is a really cool thing to look at because there's actually uh, an extensive history of maize in Europe. It was first introduced to Europe by Columbus and it quickly spread. So Columbus was sailing around in the 1490s and by uh, a couple of decades later in the early 1500s, not only were people presumably eating corn, but Raphael was painting it on the villas of uh, fancy Romans. And uh, not only were there multiple introductions, of, not only was Columbus bringing maize over, but explorers from um, from around northern North America also brought maize over, and there are potentially other introductions as well. And so, briefly, we can, even though we don't know what the phenotypes of these maize land races are, we can use a polygenic score to estimate these phenotypes. And this is essentially summing up the allele frequencies and the effect sizes of all of these individuals. Um, and so, individuals with a higher polygenic score are carrying more alleles that increase that trait. And then we can treat these polygenic scores like phenotypes and test for selection in the same kind of way that I showed you earlier. Um, so now our test is comparing um, so, uh, the slope of relatedness, or a slope between relatedness and our polygenic score, um, standardized by the VA we estimate from our GWAS hits, and our, uh, the amount of variation explained by relatedness. And so when we do this for 22 traits across a number of principal components, we see evidence for adaptation in European maize at a number of different traits and different principal components. And from here, we can actually dive in to try to understand what the selective agents might be that shape this variation. So for example, we see evidence for the number of brace roots diverging along principal component one. Um, and so for the non-plant or non-maze biologists out there, brace roots are these roots that sort of sit above the actual root mass. Um, and this is how they might look on a typical maize plant, um, but they can get quite extensive. This is a whole brace root mass right here. Um, and so, while we may not know directly why brace roots are adaptive, we can already see that our predicted brace root number is correlated with latitude within Europe, and this is consistent with what bi brace root biologists also see in North America. They see a latitudinal climb. And so this is the kind of thing we can then use to generate new hypotheses about selection based on our observations. So overall, what I've told you about today is that first, we can use the relationship between principal components of relatedness and trait values in order to detect adaptation um, in populations of individuals. Um, we can show that local adaptation has shaped trait divergence in maize, both when we look at direct measurements of traits and at predicted trait values using polygenic scores. <laughs> And finally, I think there's a lot of potential to use these methods in additional systems. And if you're interested in doing that, please get in touch or keep a lookout uh, for this method. And in conclusion, I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, my co-authors, Jeremy, Jennifer, Graham, and Jeff, as well as my host labs and NSF for funding. And I'll be starting up my own lab in 2019 at Michigan State. So please get in touch if you're interested in working together. And thank you for listening.